You published, uh, James Scott, your first book 50, 50 years ago, uh, in 1966. It was entitled Political Ideology in Malaysia. Uh, and since then, uh, many of your books have been uh, specialized studies uh, on agrarian societies in South Eastern uh, Asia, like uh, Moral Economy of the Peasant that you wrote in Paris, as you just told me, uh, Weapon of the Week, and more recently, The Art of Not Being Governed, which has been translated into French as Zomia in 2013. However, you made constant efforts to widen the perspective to other social and political contexts through uh, theoretical and historical essays such as comparative political corruption, a reader in political clientelism, and obviously tr domination and the art of resistance, seeing like a stake or against the grain. So in that perspective, your work relates to various contexts. And we've seen like throughout the years, throughout history, you've been um, basically discussing state authority, capitalist economy, and standard standardization of cultures that go with them too. So we think also about other movements such as the Zapatista Autonomous Movement in Mexico, um, but also more recently in the States we can relate to Occupy Wall Street and in France Nuit Debout and coming back to today we can also think of the ZAD for instance in, in um, uh, Notre Dame des Landes and other places of resistance occupation. Which is interesting is that for instance places like ZAD has also brought international attention with uh, people joining the movement, now thinking of Vandana Shiva from leading people claiming access for lands and indigenous movements. So according to you um, like in this world dominated by capitalist nation state, uh, according to you, uh, are these new ways of contesting from within state authority? I guess I want to preface my remarks by saying that I don't consider myself a pundit. That is, if you're asking me where the future is headed, um, as we say, you're barking up the wrong tree. Uh, it seems to me that um, I don't know any more than anyone in this room about where the future of capitalism and social movements uh, are headed. Uh, the best I can do is to try to think carefully about previous social movements. Um, and I guess let me go back to say that the one thing I have learned, I think, I, I am a, an American soixante huit art. Uh, formed by the Vietnam War, uh, and I decided after my first work in Malaysia that I would devote my life to understanding the peasants, uh, the peasantry. It's the largest class in world history, the most important class historically, and if development means anything, it should mean something for peasants, and if it doesn't, the hell with development. Uh, and so in that respect, I decided to devote myself to the understanding of wars of national liberation and the peasantry. And of course, that um, since I had some experience in France, that led me to French historians and studies of the revolution and so on. So I was quite influenced by French uh, scholarship uh, at the time. But the one thing I did learn I think, is that centralized revolutionary movements have almost always resulted in a state that was more oppressive than the state that they replaced. We think of Leninism and so on. Uh, and in that sense, I, when, uh, let me put it epigrammatically, when the revolution becomes the state, it becomes my enemy again. Uh, and so it seems to me that it matters greatly the methods by which one achieves power, right? Uh, because they are the template for organization, uh, hierarchy, democracy, and so on. And so it seems to me the first thing that I would look at with social movements like Chiapas uh, and so on is to ask, how are they organized? To what degree uh, is it uh, par la barre that they are, uh, they develop their techniques, they develop their goals, uh, and so on, and how accountable are the elites to those. And so I am the enemy of um, hierarchical movements of opposition because I think they replicate state uh, structures in their own organization. 
Thanks. Um, it's coming to that uh, makes me think about how these movements are using also political communication and words uh, to express themselves. So these protests, especially re more recently, we see all over the world, they heavily rely on new media. Um, you can think about various channels, whether social media, others, um, and to appeal to a larger public. And I think Benjamin has a couple of questions about that yeah. for you. As we received you in the this department of uh, political communication, I wanted to to share with you and the students some issues from that. According to uh, an American scholar, Anne Cronin, in her book, Public Relation Capitalism, we are witnessing the emergence of uh, commercial democracy in which public relations, promotional culture, and the media play a new central role. And as the conventional uh, democratic uh, promise of political representation loses traction with the public in many countries, uh, commercial democracy promises representation, voice, and agency uh, to the public, and in doing so, uh, create new forms of social contracts. Uh, giving voice to the voiceless, which is the name of our uh, symposium, becomes one of the leaders' uh, promotional uh, slogans, a central element of their legitimizing cosmology. Uh, so, hidden transcripts, to take, your, take back your, your concept, tend to be considered as a symbolic role uh, as that should be extracted, uh, get in shape, uh, promoted, sold, and so on. So government and private companies uh, try to use big data and online uh, social media to their own profit, uh, as shown recently by the fa Facebook scandal. So behind the scene activities uh, which, on which you're interested, more and more become behind the screen activities, and they are under uh, intensive uh, observation. Uh, even protest movements uh, engage into kind of marketing of rebellion and using the media as a tool of protest. So do you consider that this protest process of mediatization uh, of contem contemporary democracies should bring us to reconsider the distinct distinction between public and hidden transcript uh, to redefine the logic of what you call uh, the politics of reputation in uh, the points of the week? I, I don't think I have much original to say about where the world of social media is taking us. Uh, and I understand what you're saying about especially our voice as consumers and the manipulation of consumer desires as being at the center of the social media. But uh, my impression is that for purposes of political, um, for purposes of political communication, what the social media do is to just vastly accelerate the volume and speed of the circulation of rumors and gossip uh, and so on. And so rumors and gossip only are successful, are, are only successful to the degree that they answer to our fears and desires and darkest nightmares and expectations and so on. So they have to begin with always the kind of desires of the population being appealed to. Even, this is true for advertising in general. I mean, if you, many big advertisements, let's say, have a, a handsome man or a beautiful woman uh, uh, and we would all like to be handsome and young and dashing uh, and so on. And next to that is a BMW or a bottle of Scotch whiskey. And we are then are expected to make the translation between, no, we can't be young and beautiful and handsome, but we can have the whiskey, we can have the BMW. And they, uh, they rely, in a sense, on our utopias, on our desires. And it's the same thing with politics, so that rumor and gossip depend on people's values. If someone comes out wearing the wrong dress and clothing and so on, it's only a scandal if people have ethics and standards about what people should wear and their modesty and so on. So it seems to me, enfin, uh, at the end of the day, uh, these social media have to depend on local standards. Now, the real question that I'm not qualified to answer is the degree to which those standards are debased and corrupted by the social media themselves uh, over, the long, over the long term. Lies in the, the 
discretion uh, while in that case we're not going to make public so that's why uh, right so l l let me for the purposes of discussion give an example of the way in which someone who wants to be a leader uh, and has a goal in mind has to adapt themselves to local standards. So you're all familiar with Martin Luther King, right? If, if you examine at a granular level his, the history of his sermons, you can see a pattern. And the pattern is he will try a certain theme, a certain phrase, a certain critique. And if his audience in the church uh, are beating their feet or clapping and saying amen, he will recapitulate the theme in new words. He'll try it again and again and again. And so if you think of Martin Luther King over a period of seven, eight, nine years, the themes that did not have resonance, that did not result in a kind of the enthusiasm of the churchgoers in the South, were themes that dropped out of his sermons altogether. And the themes that remained were the ones that answered the expectations and hopes and so on. So you could say, I would say, that over the long run, the people in the church wrote Martin Luther King's sermon for him. Because over time, it, so imagine a medieval singer in the village, in the town square, who has to live by the centime that people give him because of his songs. Let's imagine he has a thousand songs that he can sing. He's not going to sing a thousand songs. He's going to sing probably eight or ten. And those are going to be the songs that result in centimes being thrown in his hat, right? And so his repertoire may be vast. But the repertoire will be narrowed in order to meet the tastes and enthusiasm and desires of his audience. And so that, it, it seems to me, is the way in which, if you like, the voiceless are, it, it's the way charisma truly works. Uh, that is to say, by having this perfect pitch for the music, right, for the res resonance. So, so charisma is not you know, I do not have charisma the way someone would have five euros in their pocket. Charisma is a resonance, is a relationship, right? And it's established in a quasi-mutual way. Uh, and so I think that in a, in a truly democratic setting, uh, there is a way in which over time, uh, or au or long term, uh, the, the, the audience uh, shapes the... A message from above as much as the people above shape the values of the people below. Um, so I'd, like, I'd like just to come back um, to your previous work about Zomia and especially Southeast Asia in general and the modern form of protest that you, have, you may have witnessed there and also uh, worked on before. Um, there's something quite interesting that we might be seeing for the last perhaps decades and eventually more with these political communication issues and social media, is a way people organized uh, transcending countries and regions. Um, for instance, we can think of the Kurds, of the Tibetans also, who, are, who rely heavily on what you call uh, sub, um, capital sympathy. I mean, they, they rely on cultural sympathy and they rely on different forms of, of support uh, throughout the world while others might not benefit from this kind of support because they are seen differently. Um, there's, I mean, are these trans trans transnational networks forming in a way a new form of Zomia, if we can say. Uh, if we think of um, the North East India, for instance, people relate to each other, although they're not in the regions anymore, and they, they get support, they gain support, they work also within the state and with the state uh, to form new forms of resistance. Um, so how do they walk that fine line? How do they organize today differently from what you have already worked on and experienced before? It seems to me that um, the problem of minorities that are unrepresented, stigmatized, and that spill across borders, uh, like the Kurds, for example, in four different countries, um, 
the, their, historically, this is, if you like, the problem of the nation state uh, with its hard borders. And these borders have no actual relation to the distribution of language, cultures, and peoples across those borders. So the Akka, the Kachin, uh, many of the groups in Southeast Asia spill across two or three uh, borders. So the question is, uh, these people are minorities, often stigmatized or at least ignored. Uh, who, and it seems to me that the international system has to develop a form of limited sovereignty so that these people can control their language, their culture, some of their resources, their educational system, and so on, so that they can have an existence as a language and a culture that is across borders but does not threaten wars of succession because we're not going to create millions of new nation states to accommodate all these small groups. So we have to invent something short of national sovereignty, uh, we, them, uh, that allow people to have a kind of coherence and identity uh, that is never successfully captured by the nation state. And the Kurds happen to be maybe the best example of that and the Tibetans uh, as well. Interesting thing about if, if you go historically, let's say in late Ming China, there's a hierarchy of assimilation. That is to say, if you send someone from Beijing out to the provinces and you ask him to classify all the different ethnic groups, he will write back, well, they're the so-and-sos, and they are almost Han, right? They are assimilating to our culture, and shortly they will disappear into Hanness, right? Then there are people on their way to becoming Han. And then there are people, we're, we're going down lower, there are people who could be Han if they wanted to and if we wanted them to. And then there are people who could never be Han because they're actually animals and not really human beings, right? Uh, and so you have this, and the Tibetans are an example, as the Jews were in Europe, of a minority that was never going to be assimilated. That is to say, they, they were not on their way to becoming Christians, to becoming, right? So it seems to me that Tibetans, they have a religion and identity that they are never going to uh, trade in for becoming Han. And the same is true for the Chinese Muslims, the Uyghurs and the Hui. Uh, so uh, the, the real problem, of course, are, I mean, it, States do not have, you know, the, the, the Breton and the people in Languedoc eventually became uh, Frenchmen. Uh, and so, uh, but these, there are certain groups that cannot be successfully swallowed. Uh, and they have to be accommodated. And this is uh, Jean-Paul Sartre in Jew and Anti-Semite, in which Sartre says, the liberal says uh, that um, you can um, you can be Jewish, but you can't really. If you insist on being Jewish, you can't be a Frenchman. And the conservative says you can be a Frenchman, but you have to stop being Jewish. And he says, I want to be a Frenchman and a Jew at the same time. Uh, and this is what the revolution should have promised me, right? And so, in that sense, um, uh, the nation states have to accommodate these cultural differences that are that are rock-like and solid, and at least for the time being, right? At, at least, I mean, I don't think we should freeze those identities. That is to say, the people who are Akka or Kurd, they, they are free to, to change whatever it means to be Kurd as long as they don't have a pistol at their temple. So that's my, right? Uh, they ought to be free to change their culture, but not uh, by, uh, by threat. Kind of staying in this region, uh, we are quite interested by your new work and your new body of work about the Rohingyas. Would you like to discuss with us a little more what are you specifically looking into um, right now in the Rohingya resistance? I mean, that I, we know for sure that there's a diaspora as well in Malaysia and in other countries, and they have some, some kind of support. They have, of course, humanitarian help as well, but that you know, tremendous um, difficult situation at the moment. At the same time, there are also examples of people collecting songs and dialogues and poetry made within the camps in Bangladesh. Um, 
what is your research telling us today about resistance among the Rohingya and how, what kind of forms, what kind of how, what's the shape that we can see today? I have not been conducting research on the Rohingya. Uh, I, I hope to write a book on the Irrawaddy River and on minorities, and I'm helping to organize a conference on the Rohingya in December, a conference that will probably have to be held in Thailand, in Chiang Mai, because it will be broken up probably in Burma. Uh, and so I follow, I follow the Rohingya, um, and I could say more about Rohingya history and culture, um, but I'm not a student I'm not, not a student of the Rohingya, but it is clear to me that the prejudice against Muslims in Burma is extremely strong. And of course, the Rakhine, uh, the people in western, northwestern Burma who are Buddhist, have historically also been persecuted by Islamic uh, societies, right, that have in a home in the sort of 19th century and so on. So it's a very complicated issue, but it does not negate the fact that three quarters of a million people have been ethnically cleansed from Burma, and this is a crime for which the Burmese will have to answer the way Germans had to answer for the Jews, the Turks have to answer for the Armenian, Armenians, and the Serbs have to answer for the Kosovo Albanians. Uh, so it's one of those stains on Burmese nationalism. And the reason we're organizing this conference is because it seems to me that the Burmese intelligentsia has to uh, engage with this issue because it's the most important issue in Bur Burman identity and nation state identity. Uh, but I'm no expert on the Rohingya. There are lots of other people who are, actually. Can you tell us a little more about the work on the Irrawaddy, in that case, that you're conducting? Oh, yes, I'm interested in, um, in rivers. Um, uh, rivers, rivers tell us what uh, homo sapiens and states do to natural phenomenon in the world. Uh, so the engineering and damming of rivers it seems to me is one of the great sort of human works and, and violations of, uh, if you like, natural traffic of migrating birds and fish and so on. Uh, so I'm interested, I think the history of rivers tells us a lot about human landscaping uh, and uh, the Irrawaddy River is the super highway of Burmese culture, of Burman culture. Um, and so, you can go 400, 500, uh, 600 kilometers up and down the Irrawaddy River and find the same kind of Buddhism, the same rites, the same language, of different dialects, but recognizably the same culture. If you go 20 miles into the hills, it's a completely different culture, <coughs> different language, different uh, identity. So in a sense, cultures and integration travel by water. And this is the insight of Fernand Brodel in the Mediterranean world, that places around the Mediterranean, over 300 miles of easy water, are actually closer than places that are 20 or 30 miles over hills and, uh, and mountain paths in terms of their integration and knowledge of one another. So I have a, there's a fact that I love, is that in 1800, before the steamship, it was faster to go from London or Southampton, England, to South Africa by boat than it was to go by stagecoach from London to Edinburgh. That's I mean, it's quite an astounding fact. And of course, you could carry a lot more in a boat than you could in a stagecoach. And of course, people didn't travel by stagecoach to Edinburgh. They went by sea uh, around the, the uh, southeast corner of England. Uh, but the point is that uh, that water joins rather than, uh, our maps are, are deceive us uh, because for maps a kilometer is a kilometer is a kilometer and it doesn't ask how easy is it to go from one kilometer to the next. Uh, and so 300 miles across easy water is in every way closer than it would be uh, over, over land. Uh, and that's why ancient states are always on rivers, always at the coast, uh, are always on a floodplain where you have 
a lot of uh, nutritious soil concentrated in one place because of the river. The river gives life to these early states by creating the, the floodplain that, is, uh, that allows intensive agriculture. Speaking about uh, water, uh, perhaps uh, a way to answer the question of how to, to look at uh, groups uh, trying to escape from the state uh, in the contemporary world would be to look at uh, pirates. Uh, uh, perhaps you, you speak about that in Zomia. Uh, do you know uh, works that have been conducted? Uh, yes, I, I actually, um, if I had another life, I might write a book called uh, Zomia Mouye, right? Wet Zomias, uh, in the sense that uh, swamps and marshes and mangrove coasts have always been a place to which people who wanted to escape the state could flee. The best example in the Middle East is the Marsh Arabs uh, south of Basra. For 2,000 years, people defeated in rebellions, people running from the law, uh, defeated uh, lineages and so on, went uh, and became Marsh Arabs uh, at, the, at the periphery. And so my favorite example is a, um, a swamp called the Great Dismal Swamp on the border between North Carolina and Virginia. At the end of this, at the beginning of the Civil War, there were 7,000 escaped slaves living in the swamp, many of whom had been born never seeing a white man. I mean, it was if people couldn't get to Canada, they went to the swamp because they couldn't be found successfully. And the swamp had a lot of uh, hunting and gathering, and you could actually plant corn on the little high ground that you had. The most important example, I think, for the, it's not exactly pirates, but it's the, the what is called in Southeast Asia the Orang Laut, or the sea gypsies. And these are people who, in running away from the state, didn't run to the hills, but took to their boats. And they move around the small islands in, uh, in the Indonesian archipelago and by Burma. And from time to time, they have been like the navy of Malay sultans, uh, the corsairs like the corsairs, uh, the, uh, and selling their services to the Malay sultans. Uh, they also live in a way in which they cannot be successfully taxed. They just move out of the way. So the, The, the ocean, like the mountains, is this open space in which it's very hard to control and tax and conscript a population. And we know that many of the Orang Laut, as they're called, uh, that is sea people, is to translate it directly from Malay, the Orang Laut um, have the same language as an allied group that went to the hills of Malaysia, right? And so it's as if when the Malay slave raiders came and there was You had to become Muslim. You had to have be uh, uh, circumcised. You had to give up pigs. Some people went to the hills to get away, and some people went on their boats. And a lot of other people became Malays over time. So. Thank you. Uh, perhaps the last, uh, the last question. Uh, the last question, and then we will uh, start okay. the discussion with the, with the students. Uh, it's a more political questions. Uh, you probably know the book by David Graeber called uh, Fragments of an Anarchist Anthropology. Yeah. Uh, and in this book, he was uh, wondering why so academics are Marxist or claim to be so, and so few of them uh, claim to be anarchists. You yourself uh, wrote a book in 2012 called Two Cheers for Anarchism, which has been translated in French. And you explain in this book um, that your conversion to anarchism uh, is a result of an intellectual uh, evolution linked with your disappointment toward the possibility of a revolutionary change. And you define anarchism as a praxis, uh, defense of politics, conflict debate, and a principle of uncertainty and perpetual learnship. Uh, so the book produced a lot of comments, positive and negative. How did the anarchist, uh, this anarchist uh, coming out has been received in uh, anarchist groups? Do you yourself uh, participate to uh, one of them or to collective action uh, involving anarchists? And finally, how do you combine your analysis of long-term and discrete resistance of subaltern groups, which often turn to be a sum of multi multiple individual acts, 
with the collective and often short-term dimension of political action? That's a big question. Uh, so it seems to me that almost every successful social movement, and including revolutions, are the contingent assemblage of people with many different objectives. You know, the people who made the French Revolution had radically different ideas in mind, right, about what that revolution meant. And of course, they didn't know they were making the revolution in the first place. It only became the French Revolution after it was done, right? So the idea that, I mean, the idea that we read back the people were storming the Bastille, were storming the Bastille, not, be, they didn't say we're making the French Revolution, right? Didn't happen until much later. So what's interesting to me is, is that there's this, we miss the unconsciousness, if you like, and variety of an actual social movement, an actual revolution. And then retrospectively, the winners create a narrative in which this seems much more purposeful, deliberate, and centralized than it actually, than it actually was. And the, it, it's always seemed to me also that the groups that are radically democratic, and this includes tribes and lineages in Southeast Asia, are almost impossible to control because they have to be captured one by one almost. You don't have a chief that you can bargain with, right? Uh, Pompidou had Georges Marché in 68. They could make a bargain with them, right, and leave the students by the side of the road. Uh, so it seems to me that, that what's interesting is that the, um, uh, every, my favorite example of an anarchist successful movement uh, is the solidarity movement in Poland right, uh, under martial law, uh, and that there was no centralization, no, there was no central uh, board of solidarity that told people when to strike and so on, it was completely up to them. And it had two effects, one of them, of course, it made it harder to mobilize, but once people were committed, they were committed not by following orders, but for their own volition, uh, and then they could not be, uh, there was nobody to bargain with. There was no nerve center. There was no, no way of buying them off, right? Because there was no one to bargain with. So the advantage, the disadvantage of anarchist forms of mobilization is that they are harder initially. The advantage of anarchist forms of mobilization is once they are mobilized and active, it's very difficult to put them back in the bag uh, to contain them successfully uh, because there's no one to uh, uh, who's in charge. Um, I was going to say something else, but I forgot. <laughs>